But one thing that I always have that 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 I have a little trouble with is how do people get into those eco chambers at the first place? Because if they are so, if they are so closed, um, in their structure, then how do they draw new members? How does that happen? Do people actively, actively choose to to immerse themselves in an eco chamber? Like is is it their personal individual agency that brings them into this eco chamber, or is it more of a network effect that sucks them into it? I think you just raised a very fundamental question because we want to understand how uh, the QAnon community gathers. So we, we really need to ask ourselves some these type of, of questions. So I think you can link that with the concepts of homophily and selective exposure. But it's very complicated to understand perfectly that. And in fact, studies show that there are two main outcomes. So just for you to understand homophily is just the fact of watching what you want to watch. It's just you select uh, your preferred content. You know what your preferred content is, so you will automatically look for it. And um, and yes, you, you just a selection of your preferred content. But we can also uh, consider two main outcomes, as I just said. So, uh, you, you, we can uh, differentiate between non-user, non-used consumers on social media, and on news users on social media. So first, the first ones, non-used consumers on social media. We can, I think, yes, observe that they may be unconsciously exposed to a um, lot, a lot of news, really. So. They influence their opinion because those non-used consumers are maybe social media users who just want to have fun on social media and maybe to watch some uh, fun content uh, or something else, but not directly news. But the fact is that they are confronted uh, to uh, contents related to news, but they don't uh, automatically, automatically knows that, so they are unconsciously influenced by it because they are not aware uh, of the fact that they are seeing some or politically or politically oriented content. And um, there are also the news users um, on social media, but they are, I think, a minority because some um, study uh, highlights that. There are only four percent of uh, new of uh, social media users who, in fact, uh, engage in political discussion discussions on social media. But they are very interesting because uh, they refer to a very conscious process because they select the content they want to see on social media. So here you can link it with homophily. So news news users. Um, uh really really go uh, on social media because they want to um, to get some information and because of the, po the concept of homophily they don't just want uh, to get some information but they want to get a very precise information and politically oriented information so for example they can uh, go on social media to get some far right uh, information type of information uh, and um, again, uh, it's a very conscious process, and you can link that with algorithms and also like echo chambers. I we just said before because everything is linked um, because uh, they only watch the same type of content. Algorithms again promote them this specific type of content, and it creates echo chambers because you are only confronted to a very specific type of content. I hope it is clear for you. It, it is perfectly clear. So if I understand right, there is a sort of hierarchy of agency here where we have at the very bottom, the, the non you uh, the non use consumers who are uh, incidentally uh, exposed to uh, to political content that may then over the algorithm and via gatekeepers suck them into an eco chamber where those political opinions are reproduced and reproduced. Uh, which have a social, which has then a a socializing effect on the users. Yes, it's totally that, and there are also the news users. And, and the news yes, users who who then have the the more selective exposure, where they actively immerse themselves into this, 
eco-chamber network structure, which then possibly reinforces the political views that they already held before. And at the very top, you then have the gatekeepers who actually, in a sense, manage those communities and actively choose what information to expose them to and what information not to expose them to. Is that, is, is that a, an accurate summary of, of, of the concepts yes, you've studied? It's totally accurate. Like, it's perfect, the perfect summary. So I think, you know, it's really interesting because it raises very interesting, even ethical question. Like, is it, can we consider it ethical that you can be maybe unconsciously exposed to a controversial type of content and that, in fact, people uh, control that and maybe influence you unconsciously? I'm not sure it's very ethical. <laughs> so I think it's very interesting that this topic. Okay, I see. So now, question, questions. I have some questions for you because I think we really need to deepen this topic. It's super interesting. And I know you worked on spreadability and it's still a bit blur uh, to me. So I'd like to ask you some questions on that. And first of all, since we work on social media, maybe I, I'd like to ask you uh, if we can come social media to more traditional media like the TV, the radio, etc. Okay, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, I, I dealt in my uh, individual work with the topic of spreadability and I actually found that it was a very promising uh, sort of general framework for us to uh, investigate how misinformation and conspirational thinking on social media spread. And it really boils down to this question that you just asked about what is different about uh, traditional broadcast media such as the TV or, or radio to uh to social media uh in the, in this regard so spreadability is this concept that aims to explain what makes media successful in our age of information and first of all it is a rejection of the outdated approaches to this question um that answered this question in times where broadcast media such as tv and radio were still dominant um one of those concepts that spreadability in a way rejects is um the idea that media has to be placed in a way that is sticky in order to be successful. So sticky means that it must be placed in a way that attracts as many consumers as possible and holds their attention for as, uh, for as long as possible. That is one side. And the other side is the metaphor of virality. Um, for a long time, it was believed that there could be something that is inherent to the media artifact itself that will make it succeed. Now, if a media artifact has a viral nature, it will sort of automatically, um, without the agency of any of any consumer, be transmitted throughout society. Okay, but then what alternatives does spreadability offer? So spreadability, the concept that Jenkins, Ford and uh, Green develop in their book, Spreadable Media, um, recognizes that nowadays media is successful if it spreads well. So spreadability is neither a trait inherent to the artifact itself, nor to the technological infrastructure, nor to the culture alone, but it sort of sits at the intersection of all of them. Now, the authors emphasize that media nowadays often spreads within a participatory culture, within which the lines between consumer and producer become more and more blurry. And this is really the distinction between uh, traditional broadcast media and social media today. All of us have, have posted on Instagram or, or written a tweet. And what we have to become aware of here is that with this process, we have started to produce media at the same time as we consume it. Moreover, we share things, comment on them, repost them, manipulate them and use them for our own purposes. What do you mean exactly? Um, so when I say we use them for our own purposes, for example, all of us have, um, how, how, how do I put this? When I repost a song, it might not necessarily be to uh, make others become aware of this song, but rather to frame my own identity in a certain way by reposting that song. Or if I share a video with a friend, this might be because there's something funny about this video that only makes sense in the context of like an inside joke that, that we share. Now, this shows that if media is, is versatile in this way and people, people feel an urge to use it for their own purposes, it will be more likely to be shared and therefore spreads more easily. And this is totally uh, distinct from some, some features of vir virality or, 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 
or stickiness, you see. This is really something that has to do with the culture and how the nature of the artifact, the technological infrastructure and the culture interact to make something spread. Now, here individuals really don't play this passive role like flies getting trapped in a sticky spider web or like just being the host body to a virus without being conscious of it. They actively participate in making media spread and making media uh, successful ultimately. Um, right, but of course features like the technological infrastructure are incredibly important. It can be argued that the technological infrastructure of social media gave rise to this change um, in which media spreads in the first place. If we didn't have social media, we might still be watching TV and the concept of stickiness would remain perfectly valid. Fascinating. Okay, so um, I think at this point we discussed the, the theoretical foundations of, uh, of, of, of how media, media, media succeeds and spreads and how, uh, how eco chambers form, what role gatekeepers have and what algorithms are. We dealt with that in detail. I think it is now time for us to um, really look at GAP and, and QAnon and see if we can, uh, if we can find some, some of those theoretical considerations um, in our observations and in the interviews we did. Uh, yes, I totally agree. I think it, it was very fundamental to understand that, in fact, everything is linked, like spreadability, echo chamber, gatekeeping, etc. Everything is linked and, and works together. So I think now we really understand how social media works and we can totally apply it uh, to the QAnon community and to Gab. I think we are ready. Okay, see you in the next uh, in the next recording. Bye bye. Goodbye.